electrophysiology here in Calgary over the last few years. Uh, prior to that, he did all his training at uh, Western University in Ontario. Uh, so we look forward to him joining the division come this fall. Uh, and today he's going to uh, talk a little bit about his area of interest and the kind of practice he's going to be having in Calgary. He's going to speak about integrated care in patients with heart failure and rhythm disorders. So Brennan, welcome, and we look forward to your talk. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Alworth. Um, as you're mentioning, yeah, I transitioned from Western to uh, to Libin, so it's kind of been a weird transition going from purple to pink in terms of all the all the slides that I have to create. But uh, first of all, I just want to thank you, Dr. Alworth, and and the division for inviting me to talk today. And Kelly, thank you for helping set all this up. Um, uh, as Dr. Howarth mentioned, I'm, I'm Brennan Ballantyne, one of the uh, current fellows here, transitioning to staff role very shortly in a matter of days. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about integrated care for patients with uh, heart failure and rhythm disorders. Before I begin, uh, uh, so the first acknowledgement is just to acknowledge the uh, land that we live and work on. Um, and uh, to acknowledge the rights of the uh, people. Um, I have no relevant disclosures uh, to this talk. And uh, here's just a summary of, of the things I'd like to talk about today. So first I wanna, I wanna talk about the intersection between electrophysiology and heart failure. And um, just briefly kind of give you a bit of a personal journey how I got here and some of the th things that I think that are important uh, with this over. Um, I'll then move on to integrated care for patients with uh, arrhythmia and heart failure. And finally, I'll talk about opportunities for optimization of care. And throughout the presentation, I'll be showing a couple of pictures that I just never actually get to post anywhere. Um, uh, it's been a real pleasure training here, both clinically, but also uh, in terms of the things that you get to do uh, training in a program like Calgary. My wife and I are both uh, really into the outdoors. So we spent a lot of time when we can, and we only had one child and not two, uh, skiing and hiking and um, uh, really hoping to, to get back to it uh, this winter. Um, so the, the, first, uh, the first section that I have is I really wanted to emphasize the reason that I decided to pursue this path. And um, it's unconventional, I recognize. Uh, it brought me dangerously close to a PGY. Um, but basically I saw um, when I was training in early cardiology that um, there were a number of overlaps between heart failure and EP, both research opportunities, clinical opportunities, or program uh, development opportunities. Um, and uh, I thought it would be interesting to be someone who um, had their perspective that was gleaned from training in both programs to be able to uh, be in a unique opportunity of, uh, uh, of um, uh, both clinical leadership, but also program um, development and QI leadership. Uh, to be able to bring these worlds together. Uh, I saw that these worlds often operate as a silo and I thought it was important to, uh, to pursue a training uh, path that, that brought these two worlds together. Initially, I saw a handful of, of potential opportunities um, and uh, they have grown since. This is, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but if you look, these are some of the things that I, I see as sort of potential overlaps between heart failure and EP. And obviously no one can master all of these, but uh, I have interest in a couple uh, and there's certainly opportunities to, to optimize care pathways and, and optimize the way we deliver care to patients uh, for, for a number of these uh, uh, areas. First, I wanted to focus on, um, which uh, I'm quite passionate about is risk stratification for patients with non cardiomyopathy. And as most of the audience will recognize, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patients have, uh, they're obviously at risk for heart failure event, events, but they're also uh, at high risk of arrhythmic events, including sudden cardiac death. Um, uh, I hope that I'll be able to demonstrate that it's often difficult to select patients who will benefit from device therapy for non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and, and that we need an, uh, an uh, in increased understanding of the risk stratification uh, of these patients. Uh, this is a, a busy slide, but I'll draw your attention to the important part of it. Um, basically, it's, uh, it, this is a, a summary of the landmark trials for uh, primary prevention ICDs in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy. You'll recognize some of the names uh, of the trials for sure, uh, but the thing to focus on is, is the bottom two panels there that shows the mortality benefit from implant primary prevention ICDs in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy and their associated hazard ratios. This has been uh, 
uh, a success story uh, for uh, both heart failure and electrophysiology uh, to treat these types of patients. Um, but we don't have the same sort of success when we look at the history of the trials related to patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and looking at the implantation of primary prevention ICDs for these. Um, again, focus uh, your attention on uh, the bottom here. Uh, and it shows the, the outcomes of some of these trials, which are, are, have been pretty disappointing. The CAT trial was actually stopped early, I believe after one year because of low event rates. If you look at the AMIOVERT trial, it ended up uh, being terminated early for uh, futility. Uh, the definite trial, uh, while numerically, um, there was a numerical difference, there wasn't a statistically significant. Uh, and the SCUDHEF trial, uh, kind of overlaps both ischemic and non-ischemic patients. It actually had more than half of the patients with coronary artery disease. So while it's uh, while it kind of um, uh, straddles both worlds, um, it was more of a trial of uh, ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy than non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And the elephant in the room when we talk about trials for non-ischemic cardiomyopathy uh, is the Danish trial, uh, which was the most recent. Uh, powerful trial when it comes to studying these types of patients. You'll remember that Danish, uh, the aim of this trial was to evaluate the benefits of implanting a primary prevention ICD for patients with uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. It included patients who were symptomatic, uh, who had LV dysfunction, but elevated uh, natriuretic peptides and, and who are optimized already on a guideline directed therapy um, that was available at this time. This was more than five years ago now. Primary outcome was all-cause mortality for this trial, and this was uh, this is a summary of uh, of the outcomes of the trial. And you can see even just skimming uh, the p-values here that the vast majority of them are not statistically significant. But I will draw your attention to um, the uh, uh, secondary outcome of, of cardiovascular death. And looking at sudden cardiac death, there was a statistically significant difference. Patients were implanted with a primary prevention ICD compared to those who. Uh, um, the summary for it that we take away from this is, first of all, about 65% of the control group died from uh, causes that were not arrhythmic death. So when people died, it wasn't necessarily something that we could do something about with a primary prevention ICD. Uh, looking at the subgroup analysis, we actually identified some patients who do uh, better and, and benefit from ICD, presumably because we're preventing arrhythmic death. So these were younger patients and patients with uh, lower natriuretic peptides uh, or have a heart failure phenotype. So we, the, one of the bottom lines from this is that we need to do a better job of phenotyping these patients and selecting who will benefit from a primary prevention ICD. Challenge comes with balancing um, the competing risks. These patients do have risk of sudden cardiac death and arrhythmic outcomes. We can help that by implanting um, devices, but they also are at risk of, of other events, patients with heart failure phenotypes, um, we'll have congestive heart failure, end stage adrenal disease, et cetera, that will uh, limit their lifespan and not allow them to benefit from the, the uh, benefits of, of a primary prevention ICD. So we have some, uh, some methods of risk stratifying these patients already, kind of separate up into some of the basics and some of the advanced. This is by no, mean, by no means um, uh, a, a complete list of these. Uh, but on the one side, we can look at patients with uh, LV dysfunction. Um, there are risk, risk scores that, that uh, risk stratify some of these patients. And there are some advanced things like auto, uh, markers of autonomic dysregulation or markers of electrical instability like T-wave alternans. Um, they've been investigated for years. They haven't really become something that we've been um, able to implement in prime time. Um, but one thing that will be, is, and, and will continue to be very uh, promising and important is uh, myocardial markers of risk uh, through imaging. Um, and that's something that I've been actually very interested in over the past couple of years. Um, we know that uh, late gadolinium enhancement, um, when we image patients with cardiac MRI who have, uh, who have dilated cardiomyopathy, is a very important marker uh, of, of cardiovascular risk, but specifically of uh, ventricular arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death. So this is a a relatively recent analysis that looked at patients with DCM, uh, and they looked at patients who had undergone cardiac MRI, and they evaluated the presence or absence of late gadolinium enhancement, and they also looked at the burden of late gadolinium enhancement. And the presence and absence was statistically significant, and so was the burden in terms of predicting um, who will have uh, ventricular arrhythmia or experience an epidemic death. 
and this is some flavor, local flavor. This is uh, um, uh, this is um, uh, a paper from from uh, our group here. Um, Dr. White was the senior author on on this paper, and this is uh, um, uh, from the Ciroc database uh, from the Imaging Center here that looks at. Um, the reporting of late gutted limb enhancement and a specific, uh, a specific pattern of, of enhancement, which involves the uh, interventricular septum, so-called midwall striae, uh, which is a pattern of fibrosis. Um, in this paper uh, that was recently published, um, 700 patients who had dilated cardiomyopathy were referred for cardiac MRI. The aim was to evaluate midwall striae as a risk marker for uh, arrhythmic events and heart failure outcomes. The primary outcome in this trial, uh, compared to some of the other MRI trials that have been done in the past, was actually heart failure. Um, and uh, about a quarter of these patients had midwall striae on their, uh, on their uh, imaging, and the median follow-up was quite long, it was actually over 1,000 days. Um, this graphic is actually very powerful and representative of how uh, important late gutted limb enhancement in this midwall striae um, pattern is. Uh, in, in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, you can see this uh, divided into different uh, LVEFs. So uh, to the left, you can see LVEFs of greater than 35% and to the right, less than 35%. And obviously there's a linear relationship with LVEF, but there's a striking difference uh, between patients with uh, midwall striae present compared to absent in both of these groups. Um, additionally, uh, a group um, uh, a, a group with the uh, first author, Dr. Galati, uh, had looked at midwall striae as a marker of um, hard endpoints like all cause mortality. And in fact, uh, when you looked at the cat, when they looked at the Kaplan Meyer curves, uh, it's time to event analysis for all cause mortality. There was a statistically significant difference in, in those patients with midwall striae fibrosis and without. Um, and uh, again, a very similar relationship when looking at the risk of patients with who are at risk for sudden cardiac death or aborted sudden cardiac death, even more powerful difference between those two groups compared uh, to their midwall striae pattern. And this is uh, data from, from our group. Um, uh, this was recently accepted data um, looking at uh, uh, patients, a cohort of patients who had dilated cardiomyopathy, over 1,700 patients who were available for, through the database locally. Um, the primary outcome in this trial was a composite that involved mostly arrhythmic endpoints. In follow-up was almost four years. And you can see that uh, what we tried to do is try and show that there was a similar, uh, a similar outcome in patients who had ischemic cardiomyopathy where we've already demonstrated the benefits of primary prevention ICD compared to patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy but who have the presence of midwall striae. Um, so you can see these, these labeled curves here. There's a clear difference um, with a hazard ratio of 2.31 and a statistically significant difference between patients who have non-ischemic cardiomyopathy without this pattern and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy with this pattern. Um, but, and obviously there's a difference between the ischemic group and the patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy without fibrosis. But interestingly, we found no statistically significant difference between the ischemics and the patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy with this pattern present. And when we did a uh, propensity analysis, um, which was uh, two really well-matched groups, we actually found that the curves essentially overlapped each other. These are very similar groups in terms of their risk of arrhythmic events. Um, so to close on, on this uh, method of risk stratification, um, uh, these patients, looking at patients who have midwall striae, um, there's actually a two point three, over a two-fold risk of all-cause mortality. There's over a two-fold risk of, of congestive heart failure. Um, and there's a, up to or over a five-fold risk of uh, uh, rhythmic events. Changing gears a little bit, I just wanted to, before I uh, move on to the next section, sort of show you a flavor of some of the things where um, there's a nice marriage between electrophysiology, uh, pacing, and heart failure. And I'd like to just demonstrate uh, uh, one area that's specific to um, pacement, pacing and lead-induced uh, tricuspid regurgitation. So we know um, in uh, electrophysiology and, and uh, in cardiology that RV apical pacing is, is um, not necessarily the best approach to patients because it does have a small risk, uh, but a real risk of developing pacing-induced cardiomyopathy and, and, and uh, uh, causing heart failure exacerbations. Uh, 
So we've developed techniques um, that have been successful uh, and durable uh, to be able to avoid that strategy. And, and these three boxes show uh, conduction system pacing. So there's a left bundle branch area pacing approach to resynchronizing patients, and there's a his bundle uh, pacing approach. All of these have uh, various advantages and disadvantages. But what I want to focus on is a bit of a paradigm shift, fit, shift which is happening, which is leadless pacing. Um, so you can see that this is a, a leadless pacemaker. Um, uh, you can see how small it is. Uh, the technology is, is quite amazing for the available devices that, that are on the market now. Um, this is a chest x-ray of someone who has had a leadless pacemaker implanted and some of the advantages and disadvantages. And probably the big thing that sticks out is the fact that there's no pocket or, pocket or lead related complications which is significant. Oh, I guess I threw uh, Dr. Exner in here as well. Um, so Dr. Exner uh, has, um, uh, has recently been highlighted in, in the media actually for his leadership um, uh, and for some of his research. Um, you know, we're really fortunate to be at a center that uh, there are a number of uh, operators who implant leadless. Um, uh, So um, what uh, I was mentioning before is, is uh, some of the advantages of leadless pacing with regards to avoiding complications of transvenous. This is a, a compilation of some of the uh, uh, complications associated with transvenous devices. And I'll draw your attention um, to things like pocket hematoma, infection, leadless lodgement. These are some of the higher the, the, um, uh, complications that are associated with a higher incidence. And these are, most of them are essentially uh, uh, erased with uh, advent of leadless pacing. Um, the pivotal trials, there have been a number of pivotal trials from an, uh, a handful of devices uh, for leadless pacing. And this is probably too small for you to see. So I blew up what I think is relevant, at least for, for this talk. And that's that uh, uh, leadless pacing has a very high uh, implant success rate and a, um, a very reasonable and low complication rate. And when you look at the complications compared to this other category, which is major complications, you can see that the major quite low um, and follow up uh, pivotal trials, the newer pivotal trials and also a uh, real world, world analysis actually show lower pacing. Um, why I find this interesting and which uh, an area that's um, uh, still sort of a nascent area of, of research and, and, uh, um, and sort of procedural techniques is that um, patients uh, who have transvenous devices are at risk of uh, lead-related tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, and we know that when you have significant regurg tricuspid regurgitation, um, it's associated with poor outcomes. The RV has been called the forgotten ventricle in the past. I think it's uh, had a lot more interest recently. Um, uh, both clinically and from a research perspective. Uh, but the tricuspid valve uh, has also really been forgotten, isolated tricuspid regurgitation. Um, uh, looking back at some of the data from the 90s and early 2000s uh, was really thought to be something that didn't have a significant uh, prognostic implication, which is not the case. Um, it certainly uh, has a prognostic implication. In fact, severe tricuspid regurgitation has a one-year survival of over just, or just over 60%. And isolated tri tricuspid regurgitation uh, doesn't have a very much better prognosis. Lead-related tricuspid regurgitation has been under-recognized uh, for years. Um, and uh, there's a variable um, uh, incidence and in, in prevalence, um, but it really depends on how hard you look and how you look. Um, I'm not going to get into that for this talk, but it certainly is something that uh, is of interest to some cardiographers. Um, uh, there are methods of how to evaluate lead tricuspid regurgitation and make the diagnosis that are, are, are developing. Uh, the there are multiple mechanisms for how this happens, but far and away, probably the biggest reason is for interaction with the, uh, the tricuspid valve leaflets and subvalvular apparatus. And this is really the experience that we have implanting leadless pacemakers for patients uh, and following to see if they cause tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, we know that transvenous leads do. Um, uh, this is a single center study, uh, not a lot of patients, just almost 70 patients followed for uh, a short period of time, only 11 months. So 
uh, bringing this out a little bit may cause it may uh, change the, the data um, significantly. But you can see that leadless pacemaker, while there are patients that um, that uh, change their uh, severity of tricuspid regurgitation, largely the proportion of patients stays the same. It's probably something that's not causing a significant. Sig have to wait and see what the, um, what uh, some of the follow-up data shows. What we are interested in here, we've been collecting data um, of our own experience for patients who have lead-related lead related tricuspid regurgitation, like shown in this uh, graphic here. Um, we wonder what happens when we extract leads from these patients and implant a leadless pacemaker. Um, it stands to reason that if you don't have a lead there and the etiology was lead-related tricuspid regurgitation, that these patients should improve. Um, we have a long way to go. Um, based on our cohort of patients, uh, which we, have, we actually have a few extra now that aren't included in this database, but what we've uh, collected and, and sort of curated so far, really four of six clinically improve when we extract the lead and we implant a leadless pacemaker. No patients worsen clinically. Um, uh, and uh, what we know is there's actually a high burden of atrial fibrillation, which is relevant because one of the things that causes tricuspid regurgitation is remodeling of the atria, stretching of the tricuspid valve annulus and functional tricuspid regurgitation. So this is actually something that in the future of, of uh, looking into the management of some of these patients is going to be a real confounder that we'll have to work through. Um, we know from this study too that there's a paucity of clinical events, hospital and mortality uh, numbers is really uh, within this uh, follow-up period. What happens to tricuspid regurgitation? Well, it looks like the rule of thirds. It looks like a third improved, a third didn't change, and a third worsened. So we're really at a point where we have to see where this is going, but I suspect it's not going to be a question of um, will this work to improve patients' tricuspid regurgitation? It probably will. Um, the question is when we intervene and by what markers we use to intervene. That's going to be, I think, the challenge when trying to look into how to manage some of these patients, because certainly the patients the phenotype of patients that we've seen where we've extracted the leads and re-implanted, a lot of them have atria that are massive. They've stretched their annulus already. Their RV is already dilated and, and uh, has systolic dysfunction. These are patients that probably won't improve by removing the lead. Um, uh, medical therapy might help and, and uh, uh, mechanical support uh, obviously would be another option if things progress, but we've probably missed the boat on a lot of these patients. So I think uh, the winds of change will be to find here and thinking about inter intervention. So moving on and again, changing gears a bit, what I want to talk about now is um, uh, some of the integrated care options for patients with uh, arrhythmia and, and heart failure. Knowing that there's all these options out there, what, what, you know, I, I, what am I passionate about and what I think we should focus on? So uh, putting up the necessary slides about how important heart failure is. Heart failure is important. It has a high mortality, morbidity rate. U.S. study um, looking at uh, databases of patients uh, who have who have died uh, found that one in eight deaths uh, had some sort of association with heart failure. Um, and you can see some of the natural history slides of, of patients. And heart failure is characterized by frequent uh, exacerbations and loss of hospital admissions. This is a study looking at uh, uh, patients who were diagnosed with heart failure. This is both heart failure with reduced and preserved ejection fraction, I believe. And uh, the median number of heart, heart failure hospitalizations um, over the follow-up period, which was, I believe, hospital a lot. Um, the prevalence is rising, which is uh, going to be a problem, obviously, in the future that we have to address. And not only is this important for patients and clinical outcomes and society at large, but um, there's a significant economic impact. Uh, this is Canadian data um, looking at project, projected uh, costs of hospital uh, of uh, annual um, admissions to hospital related to heart failure. Uh, and by 2030, we're looking at uh, well over $600 million annually. So this is important to address um, in a way that helps our patients uh, and uh, it helps improve their clinical outcomes, but also helps improve our um, bottom line, so to speak. Um, integrated, this is a model of integrated care that, that I found that I, I, I really like. Um, it shows that the patient's at the center. So that's probably the most important thing is that integrated care for any type of patient, whether it be 
for heart failure and, and device patients, for heart failure and, and arrhythmia or cardiomyopathy patients. Obviously, this we have to proceed in a patient-centric approach. But why I think it's important and why I think that we have the capacity to do this here is um, some of the uh, necessary th um, uh, resources and some, some of the necessary requirements for developing an integrated care team. Uh, Co-localized resources, multidisciplinary team, obviously a priori standards and protocols, but also coordinated communication and education. We have excellent leadership here. We have a team that, that we have, a, we work on a system that's extremely well integrated. Um, we have uh, very centralized access to resources um, and we have the ability to, to, uh, to integrate care for these patients, to streamline information sharing, uh, to mobilize resources and interventions uh, quickly to intervene at the op opportune time. Um, all of this empowers patients and it improves their outcomes. But does this actually matter? Should we be practicing in an integrated care way with multidisciplinary teams and, uh, um, uh, and doing these sorts of things? Or should we just carry on with, with the status quo? Well, guidelines certainly say we should. Um, guidelines, all, all, all types of guidelines, heart failure guidelines, valve guidelines, you name it, always give a class one recommendation. But if you look at the evidence, it's actually pretty poor. So we know we should be doing this, um, but we don't really know why. Um, and in cardiology, we have been doing it in a number of different disciplines in cardiology, but we have not really done a good job of studying the impact of integrated care teams. Other specialties certainly have. Uh, if you look at the oncology literature, there's very, very powerful outcomes uh, related to mortality benefits, working in a multidisciplinary team and having an integrated network for caring for patients. One specific uh, uh, example comes from breast cancer um, literature. Patients with invasive breast cancer uh, do extremely well when they're cared for a team that's integrated. Study showed a 20% a mortality reduction in these patients. Interventional cardiology has published some literature uh, that shows that um, uh, that shows valve teams for for complex valve uh, interventions as well as more uh, uh, complex revascularization uh, decisions. Um, one way of also looking at it is well, if we integrated care matters, what happens when we disintegrate care? And there have been literature both from uh, the arrhythmia side and the heart failure side showing different examples of, in quotation marks, disintegrated care. One recent uh, publication comes from the AF literature uh, that actually looks at this, uh, um, this outcome called care fragmentation. So basically it, it shows that patients who are admitted to a hospital with atrial fibrillation um, and uh, on their index visit, they're from hospital, if they are readmitted at a different center and treated by a different team, uh, the uh, outcomes are extremely different compared to if they're readmitted at the same center. Percent increase in the odds of, in, uh, in, of hospital mortality for those patients. Um, this is just one example. Uh, but not only does it have an impact on mortality, it lengthens hospital stay, there's more healthcare expenditure, this makes a difference. Uh, and the, the takeaways from this group were that this is difficult because there's so many confounding factors to figure out what the causative reason for this is, but there are a number of factors that you can think of that would contribute to this difference. In a, inadequate healthcare, um, uh, inadequate health information transfer, variations in, in protocols and standards, prescriber errors, errors, et cetera. So it sort of does highlight the need for uh, approached patients with complex disease. And that being said, these sorts of things do come with a challenge. Um, received or, or who, that have been published um, are that uh, are barriers to the integrated care of heart failure and arrhythmia patients uh, I've shown here. Uh, one is, is that we're often an interventional specialty, specialty compared to a specialty that's focused on prevention. And um, that's important for different reasons, but specifically for, for the one I'm talking about, that means that there is a very, very large bar burden for risk stratification. Um, and there's a very large burden for patient selection. This comes 
with time. This comes with experience training. So it creates these silos that then are a huge barrier to integrating uh, uh, care of these patients. Um, there's significant implications to, in quotation marks, missing the boat. So you don't recognize that your heart failure patient who you're treating in the device clinic is slowly getting worse um, and uh, slowly deteriorating to the point that now they are not a candidate for uh, mechanical support. They are not a candidate for a transplant. Um, that's a big deal. And that uh, um, is a lot of pressure on uh, a practitioner to be able to integrate uh, these two fields. And you can see why these things have been siloed. Um, these are rapidly changing fields as well. There's advances in pharmacotherapy that are happening all the time. There's advances in device therapies and technologies that are happening all the time. And there's actually frequent paradigm shifts in procedural techniques as well that, that make you stay on your toes and, and uh, uh, make you sort of focus uh, in on one of these fields. And um, as, uh, as I've demonstrated so far, um, but for, for one more reason, these are often clinically complex patients that in some ways require a silo. Patients, for example, who um, are treated through the transplant clinic or the VAD clinic. This is a large multidisciplinary clinic and a very specialized environment that to care for these patients, you need to be siloed. Um, that being said, when everyone is, there's really no one that's kind of looking and having some perspective on some of the other issues that are important to these patients. And finally, time is a big issue, not only time in clinic, uh, time, uh, administrative time, um, uh, your time caring for these patients, but also training time. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that I'm pushing PGY-10, so it does take some time to, to be able to understand both sides um, uh, of the equation for, for care. So I'll close by talking about uh, a few opportunities that I see for optimizing the care of these patients. Um, and I'll stay away from uh, really concrete examples or a roadmap to how we get there because I think there's a lot of flexibility and I've already experienced the fact that things change, stakeholders change, you know, interest. Um, I think we need to stay flexible with this, but I think in, in broad terms, I'd like to at least show you three examples of, of things that I'd like to see. Uh, one is guideline uh, uh, directed medical therapy for the optimization of patients with kind of, I think, step one. This is Canadian data. This is what we see every day in the device clinic. This is what we perceive every day in the device clinic, but this is data that's been published um, out, of, uh, out of Vancouver recently. And it looks at the proportion of patients with different types of devices through the device clinic. Um, uh, it shows that almost half of them have conventional pacemakers, just over half have either an ICD or, or a CRT. And this is nice because it stratifies the patients based on their LV function. So um, almost a quarter of patients who have an ICD or CRT have LV dysfunction. This is a huge proportion of patients per device clinic and added up nationally, this is a massive number of patients uh, followed primarily by electrophysiologists um, in specific centers, but have heart failure. Um, and there is a huge gap in how we're treating these patients. Um, electrophysiologists are very, very good at starting beta blockers. Um, we know that because we have bratty support for our devices and a lot of our cardiomyopathies and primary prevention and secondary prevention reasons for putting in these devices will respond to beta blockers. So we're very comfortable with that. Um, we, through time, have been very comfortable, obviously, with ACE inhibitors and ARBs. What we're not as good at in device clinic is recognizing when somebody should be on an MRA, when somebody should be on Entresto or an, uh, an, an, an Arnie, and when recognizing when somebody should be on an SGLT2 inhibitor. See that um, uh, these are massive gaps uh, in terms of patients who are eligible for prescription but not prescribed these medications. And that translates into huge differences in survival. Um, this is a really, really important slide. This has been done in, in you know, different, uh, with different patient populations in different countries, single center, multi-center. Um, this data uh, is, is striking when showing the difference in mortality and longevity in patients who are optimized compared to not optimized. So this shows, um, this is published in The Lancet uh, a couple of years ago. This shows survival, all-cause mortality differences. Patients who are on comprehensive therapy 
versus conventional therapy. Conventional therapy is beta blocker, plus or minus ACE inhibitor, and comprehensive therapy includes other agents. That's the way that they defined it, at least well. And you can see for somebody who is age 55 and is on, is the difference between comprehensive therapy and conventional therapy accounts to an eight year, an over eight year difference in event fee survival, potentially over their lifetime. Um, the, the next difference is look at somebody who is diagnosed and, and treated at age 65. That corresponds to over six between those who are optimized compared to those who aren't optimized. These are massive, massive opportunities and, and huge gaps and a, and a failure of the system if we, if we don't address it. We've tried to address this. Um, we've uh, proposed uh, pathways for, uh, to try and optimize patients um, who are not optimized through the device clinic. I think the device clinic is probably a really good place to start because a proportion of the patients are followed by heart failure physicians, a proportion of the patients are followed um, by uh, primary cardiologists, a proportion are followed through the heart failure clinic. Those patients aren't necessarily the target. Uh, the target to begin with um, uh, should be uh, patients who are managed primarily by electrophysiologist or by a primary cardiologist who isn't comfortable starting some of these medications. Also which is also um, uh, something that's happening. And um, our initial strategy was to pull people into a pathway that was still confined to the device clinic, uh, optimize these patients through a specific titration or clinical pathway, and then feed them right back into the device clinic without any change to the location that they're being treated, without any change to the primary care physician. Um, this has been held up for a number of reasons, mostly because of COVID. A lot on their plate in the last couple of years. We're still trying to get to the, we're still just coming out the, the end of this. And I think people are starting to want to um, uh, more onto their plate. Um, uh, and I think we need to do probably a better job of addressing some of the important stakeholders and who's actually going to take the burden of this. Um, but I do think it is important. And whether it be a pathway that uh, happens through the device clinic or a specific specialized clinic that's in a completely different environment that has the support, uh, the time, um, and, uh, uh, and the staff available to, to manage these patients, one of those things has to happen. Um, and I showed you the objectives. Uh, we need to optimize these patients. We need to streamline. We need to have ongoing quality improvement initiatives. Um, device optimization is kind of the second uh, strategy. So we are very good with optimizing um, uh, devices like pacemakers and ICDs. We've had a very long time uh, with experience doing that. Uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy has been out for quite a long time and we have some experience with that as well, but it's very complex. And now there's this new kit on the block conduction system patient that uh, um, we need to learn a lot more about. Um, again, this is the Canadian data that I presented earlier. Um, and I, I just show this because it, it, it shows the proportion of patients who have a CRTD versus a CRT implanted. Um, almost 40% of patients have some sort of resynchronization therapy based on. This is important because these are very difficult patients to manage through a routine, uh, very busy device clinic. We're quite good at it in, uh, uh, in academic centers. Uh, things will probably change in terms of the paradigm of how we deal with these patients the more uh, conduction system pacing leads are implanted, which is happening now. Um, but certainly, this is extremely applicable to community centers. Very, very busy, and they have um, their their interests are extremely stretched um, uh, throughout the day. Um, I'll just leave this slide here to show you that cardiac resynchronization therapy has been here for a long. Time. Extremely important. There are massive uh, benefits in terms of mortality, possible admissions for heart failure. Uh, functional status and quality of life. Um, so we know it's an important therapy, but we also know there's a segment of patients who don't respond to this therapy. Um, uh, it depends on the trial you look at, but up to a third of patients uh, do not respond to cardiac resynchronization therapy, despite our best benefit to select these patients who should be appropriate for the therapy. Um, this was data that we uh, worked on and published uh, when I was in London. Yeah. And this shows the implication of, um, uh, of not re uh, responding to patients who are non-responders to CRT. Uh, this is a meta-analysis looking at um, uh, patients with CRT 
uh, and comparing them to uh, comparing patients who are responders compared to non-responders and adding um, patients who just have an ICD uh, to this cohort. This is what you'd expect. Um, CRT responders do better than non-responders, obviously, uh, with respect to uh, ventricular anemia uh, with a statistically significant p-value. But what's interesting is if we look at patients who have CRT and who are identified as non-responders, um, the, the, um, when you compare them to patients who have an ICD, uh, the patients with an ICD have fa more favorable outcomes. Um, this, there's a number of ways of explaining this data. Um, there's a, a certain um, uh, space in the literature that suggests that CRT in some patients could be prorhythmic. Um, and there's a certain amount of patients who, if they don't uh, respond to CRT, other interventions need to happen, which again, we're, this is the so-called missing the boat stage. Uh, and then the last stage, the last you know, confounder could be that patients who were not uh, candidates for CRT don't have a big wide left bundle, they just have inherently. Um, but this is important to recognize because um, we need to intervene on these patients early who are non-responders who should have responded uh, and attempt to, to uh, make them respond because the outcomes are drastically different between responders and non-responders. Um, don't read this slide. <laughs> I, just show, I just put this up here to show you that this is a proposed algorithm in a clinic um, for patients who are, are non-responders. And there are a plethora of these out there, um, but you can see how complex this becomes trying to manage patients who have CRT non-response. And it's a mixture of clinical, uh, clinical changes, medication changes, um, uh, uh, looking at, at, at blood work and, and uh, metabolic derangements, and also um, evaluating the actual diagnostics and uh, um, uh, settings for some of these patients. And some patients, there's this uh, threshold um, of intervention where we don't want to take them back to revise their lead or to revise their device. Sometimes it's a hard thing to do to make the decision to re. But uh, it, often it's very, very important. And by having a focused clinic or a focused scope uh, to always be targeting improvement and, and uh, optimization of these patients, I think you'll be able to, in your mind, lower the threshold for re-intervening on some of these patients. Um, the manufacturers of devices have made this a little bit easier for us. I'm sure this will improve over time. Um, each device manufacturer has algorithms that are all proprietary that have been shown to improve the res response rates to uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy. Um, and uh, I sort of put this up also to hammer home the fact that there's a number of reasons for why these patients are not always device related. arrhythmia. So these are uh, it requires um, protocolize these patients clinically um, and to adequately evaluate reasons for, for not. A couple of minutes. Um, massive area. This would be a talk on its own. Um, but what I wanted to, to Home monitoring has obviously revolutionized the way that we care for patients with devices. Um, it gives us uh, gives us alerts when when we have a lead integrity problem. This is alerts when our ba the batteries and the devices are running low. Um, it gives us alerts and sends us information about ICD therapies. But uh, really, when you look at remote monitoring uh, to detect and predict uh, heart failure events, the the information over the last ten to fifteen years of the data has been pretty disappointing. We can do it. Um, but either we can't change the clinical course, we can't improve patient outcomes, or it's not very sensitive nor specific. Um, however, recently technological advancements look like this is sort of a, re, uh, a burgeoning field, there's sort of a, a, a revival or renaissance of, of, um, of this area. Heart failure diagnostics are built into some devices. Um, you can see here the list of things that a device would look at. Uh, and, um, uh, and integrate all this information to come up with a risk of a patient developing and worsening heart failure. Um, these are some tracings that show some of the things the device is looking at, thoracic impedance. You can imagine that um, if you develop fluid through your lungs, your thoracic impedance is going to get uh, as your lungs fill with water. Um, there's an index that actually tracks uh, thoracic impedance and the risk of, of or, or the, the presence of uh, um, congestion. And then things like 
heart rate, uh, variability, um, patient activity level, all these things can be integrated. In. <clears throat> this is more recent data, so it's a little bit more promising that patients who are in the alert zone, there's clearly a difference um, in clinical outcomes. And this study that was published recently showed a difference in the time to death, actually, when patients are in uh, the alert zone compared to out of the alert zone. The two things that have to be addressed are what do we do about these patients or can we actually change their clinical course? And I do think that over time, these things will need to become more sensitive because 50 days in the alert zone um, before there's actually a difference is, is quite long. I think we probably need to intervene. There's a huge future in remote monitoring that we'll probably be able to um, we'll probably be able to integrate already uh, invasive monitoring with uh, pump implants has shown to to improve patient um, wearable devices there are has have exploded in the last five years. This is going to be a field on its own that's going to be difficult weeding through wait. I found this cool. This is a scale um, that patients step on once a day and it feeds a bunch of uh, CG and biometric information and uh, uh, collates it into an online database and it, it, it have the scale alert. Risk. And then I think one of the biggest things uh, that will develop out of all of this will be the ability of, of AI and machine learning to integrate some of this information. We're clearly capturing all this information through devices. It's obviously important, but we have not been able to find what the magic bullet is, when the opportune time to intervene. I think that AI and machine learning. I'll close by this, just showing this again, all the opportunities that, that As I'm finishing, and this is last week of fellowship actually. Um, and uh, Dr. Lyons, who was the program director for Heart Heal. Even if I did one of these fellowships, I would like. Sure, but the fact that I had to integrate these fact that I had to do it uh, in a sort of a sandwich technique where I had a gap in uh, EP made things a little bit really it was probably quite uh, difficult, at least from an administrative status. So I, I really appreciate uh, the flexibility from both Dr. Lyons. And I'll close there. Uh, thank you very much. And online, we'll be looking at the chat. Yes. I think we still have a ways to go. But uh, when it comes to something as important, Sudden cardiac death or prevent. You have to be certain. As we have uh, quite a bit of literature already that uh, that is. Big barriers to starting, uh, Dr. Schneller says, a barrier to starting in Tresto and Epic. It's something where, again, it's um, when 
on the heart failure inpatient service, it's often something that we don't worry about as much because uh, we have a, a pharmacist with us. We, we do this all the The big barrier for something like the device clinic. Starting these medications, we don't know the uh, patients as well. We also don't have the support for some of That being said, um, the cover, uh, coverage for Entraso and natural LT2 inhibitor, most indications is now um, available across. It's the prob problem is the young patients. There's still a lot of patients who develop cardiomyopathy um, and uh, need life changing and life saving medications, and they're expensive. Passionate release programs are, are now over. Uh, any, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not aware of. Uh, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll report, report the question. So, Dr. Cavanaugh was just saying that uh, we talked about the presence of midwall stria as a risk marker, um, but burden has not been evaluated. There's certainly um, evidence for burden of late gadolinium enhancement in patterns that are not related to the midwall stria. Um, so we know that the more burden uh, you have, the, the higher risk of, of both heart failure, um, uh, CRT non-response, and uh, and rhythmic death. Uh, is higher, um, but uh, from what I'm aware of, uh, the midwall striae is a presence or absence uh, feature. Heart failure pathway is an opportunity to comment about uh, pathways actually to prompt you to to start. I am not aware. I don't think the data is out there to look at the dual chamber by to to uh, patients who have atrial devices. Um, certainly, there's much, much, much more data for a transvenous lead through the. 
but yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm, I, I, I re, there is a patient uh, who known to the service who actually has an atrial eye device, so one lead that it looks to be causing significant tricuspid prolapsing into the. That's certainly something to look at. Um, uh, whether we've looked at DDD. ICDs versus DDD pacemakers. Um, I'm not aware of any data that shows a difference between the two, but what we do know is that um, uh, general cause a little bit more uh, tricuspid regurgitation, not a significant amount more, but it's probably because it causes a bit of a more inflammatory reaction and fibrosis related to the Yeah, that's, that's definitely. Yeah, very good point. I might be putting myself out of business here. Um, that's some, oh, the, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Dr. Quinn was just saying, um, you know, maybe comment a bit on some of the impacts of comprehensive care of patients with heart failure with regards to um, arrhythmic risk or, or uh, the arrhythmic burden of, of, of these patients. Uh, and it's true, um, there have been, you know, one of, I guess, just going back to something we already talked about, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patients, we do know that um, uh, although we're doing well for these patients and preventing heart failure exacerbations, hospitalizations, death, death from, uh, from pump uh, dysfunction, uh, we're also preventing uh, arrhythmic complications and sudden cardiac death related to arrhythmic death by treating these patients. There's very good data that we're doing that. Um, yeah, I, in one way, uh, I may be putting myself a bit. <laughs> I'd be, you know what? I'd be happy if I put myself out of business because you did the right thing. Happy. <laughs> okay, Brennan, thank you. We're at the top of the hour, and that closes uh, cardiac grand round for the.